Let me, let me begin uh, with a point that Dan made. Remember 1.3 billion. Anything multiplied by 1.3 billion is a big number. The opposite is also true. Anything divided by 1.3 number billion is a small number. As one thinks about the total size of China's economy or the per capita, the costs of a healthcare system or the amount that can be spent on any individual, the challenges that China still faces is generalized from the 1.3 billion to numbers. Numbers are very telling and numbers can be very misleading, and they can be a way of getting at what is happening in this dynamic and diverse country. For example, China has elevated over the last 35 years, give or take 300 to 350 million people into the ranks of the middle class. Very impressive. What that means is a billion have been left behind. A billion people have been lifted out of poverty, many of them to the level of $2 a day. That's not very wealthy. So the ch kinds of challenges that are inherent uh, in these numbers and this diversity. Uh, I spent 26 years as a U.S. government official. Every night I say, thank you, God, for not making me a Chinese official. Yeah. I would not want to have to contend with the challenges of this huge country, this complex country, which is managed, administered in a highly centralized fashion. Managing a geography as large and diverse, now an economy that is as complex, more or less everything has to funnel through Beijing, has to funnel through the seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee. It's an enormous challenge. Another aspect of the diversity of China is that almost anything that you hear or read about it is likely to be true. Some place at some time. That it's a classic blind man and the elephant. What you look at determines sort of what you see. And to be aware of in articles in the newspaper, classroom materials, so what are people focused on? You can read about China as this wonderful panda country that is rising peacefully to make a harmonious world, or China symbolized by the dragon, uh, fire breathing, inspiring awe and fear in its neighbors and its own people. And within the American China Studies community, there are panda huggers and dragon slayers. Uh, that Dan made the reference to Yellow Peril, uh, which is, of course, a racial ethnic uh, way of thinking. But there's more people who look at China as a security problem or challenge, an economic threat. It's not ethnic or racial, but there's a negative depiction. And there are those uh, with evidentiary basis who will point to the common good, public good, contributions to the global society and economy, all are true. And part of the challenge in teaching and learning about China is sorting out the relative balance at any given time. My assignment today is to talk about the role of the United States in China's modernization. China's rise, if you will. We have played a very big role in what has happened in China in the last 35 years. 
again, depending on the audience and how it's characterized, the Americans have been diabolically clever in transforming China. Or we have been unbelievably stupid in creating a rival that will surpass, displace, not just the United States role in the region and the world, but our way of life. I'm much closer to the panda hugger, much closer to the we've been pretty clever. So you ought to know that bias uh, up front. And I spent much of my career in building U.S.-China relations. Uh, started studying China in 65, was part of the ping pong process, uh, and was part of the normalization process beginning in the Ford administration. Let me go back to Nixon and Mao, 1969-1970. We have convergence in time of two leaders who could do something that most others in the country could not. Nixon's anti-communist credentials gave him a political capacity to interact with China that no liberal politician could. Mao, at the time, had unchallenged, unquestioned authority. When he turned on a dime and the Americans switched from being enemy number one to a partner, nobody was going to challenge it. So we both sides were kind of lucky. The reason we came together was very simple. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Both of us were more concerned about the Soviet Union than about one another. Surely, realpolitik, balance of power, instrumental. Mao didn't like the Americans, American system. Nixon didn't like the Chinese system. We had common purpose. Out of that, in less than a decade, we moved to a really rather remarkable partnership. That happened in my judgment because Mao's death cleared the way for policy change in China. And the leaders that succeeded Mao, Deng Xiaoping is normally cited, but it was a very large team of veteran officials who have looked back at the first 30 years of the People's Republic and the largely autarchic quest for a uniquely Chinese approach to modernization. A quest, as Tom pointed out, that had started a hundred years earlier. How do you become modern without losing the essence of what it is to be and with a wrinkle of attempting to do it through the Stalinist model, this was a quest by Mao, by China, for a unique way to become modern. And the net result by 1976, 77, look back, was China was not very much more modern than it had been in 1949. And it was arguably falling further behind other countries in the region, certainly the ones that we should be compared to. So there is a fundamental set of decisions taken in China that I will summarize as we got to deal with the bad emperor problem. No more mouths. That system had to be reworked to ensure that nobody could run away with it. A second was policy continuity, stability. The Chinese people, the Chinese system had been whiplashed for 30 years of rapidly changing policy directions. As you look through the history of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and other things, you will see these. You never had any idea what worked or didn't work because it didn't stay in place long enough. 
So a system was put in place that locked in policy, made it very difficult to make fundamental changes in policy direction. And the third choice was no more experimentation, which in the late 1970s meant the free world economy. Cold War, you've got a socialist model that China had tried and didn't work, and was not working all that well yet, and the free world system, which was a liberal economic order, free trade, rule-based. As Deng and the Chinese leadership was looking for a new way to modernize, to become strong, they telegraphed the thinking. Washington picked it up, said, we can work with this. But very hard to work with the previous system. And the Carter administration signaled that if you go this direction, the Americans will support and assist you. What that meant as a practical matter was that the United States would open up the free world system, sounds quaint now, uh, 20 plus years after the end of the Cold War, to China's participation. China did not have to change its political system, did not have to abandon its ideology. It's unique. It's the only country that was sort of allowed to participate in the US-led, maintained global trading system or free world trading system. And this was done for two reasons. One was, if China was going to be our partner against the Soviet Union that we and the Chinese assumed would be there as an enemy for a long time, it was better to have a strong partner than a weak partner. So making China stronger by making it more modern, by helping it to develop, it was a part of the security strategy of the United States. That was enough for many in Washington, a good enough justification for this political decision to bring China into the US-led system. There was another objective not shared by everybody, compatible one, which was we're not only going to make China stronger, a more valuable partner, by making it more modern, but by making China more modern, we're going to change China. Because you cannot be a modern society with a repressive authoritarian government, with a wholly state-run economy. And so forth. That was that was the logic, democratic theory for political scientists out there. Signaling back and forth, U.S. willingness to help, Chinese exploration of how far that went. In 1978, I was a part of this running back and forth and the signaling in it. Dunn decided to seize the opportunity that seemed to be offered by the Carter administration. Dunn compromised on one of the conditions for normalization that had blocked formal diplomatic relations for almost a decade, and that was the U.S. relationship with Taiwan. Was the, that, was the, that was the concession that Dunn made to the United States. The United States was not going to end all contacts with Taiwan. would end formal diplomatic, but not all contacts. The Americans and the Chinese, dealing here in, you know, uh, oversimplifying uh, by personalizing the places, unitary actor had different expectations and depicted it different. Dung's view is one of limited window of opportunity. 
who knows how long the perfidious Americans will allow us to participate in this system. It is probably only a matter of time until they yank the rug out, shut it down, so we got to take as much advantage of this as we can while it's there. And becoming more modern, becoming more prosperous, becoming stronger will make China more influential and safer. Uh, safer from attack by powerful other countries. And it will make China more independent. It will have to worry less about stronger rivals and competitors and those on which it was dependent. The American expectation was quite different. It was your success in modernizing will be directly dependent on the extent to which you make the domestic changes and the foreign policy changes necessary to rapidly take advantage of participation in this free world system. That if you try and hold back or have partial reform, it won't work. But the more success China had, thank you, in moving into the opportunity of this, the more deeply it meshed it would become. It would become integrated into and dependent on that system. So that China's success would not be outside of or despite the system, it would be through and because of participation in the system. I want to skip ahead. The Cold War ends. What had been the free world system is now the global system. All but a handful of countries participate in it. And it's changed China's position from being the uh, first one in 15 year, a 10 year head start on anybody into now having a lot more competition. As one looks back, certainly as I look back at the way things evolved, China's success is impressive by any yardstick. Transforming a country as big, as populous, as diverse, as rapidly as China did is really impressive. The rates of growth are not so impressive. They're actually very similar to every other country at comparable stages of development. I heard on the radio driving up here that Ethiopia has now surpassed China uh, in terms of rate of GDP growth. Uh, it started from a very low base, so it's going to grow faster. Uh, as it gets bigger, it will grow slower. Um, and I throw that out as a, another example to pay attention to the numbers. The people that straight line, China's going to grow for 10% to 25th is nuts. It can't happen. It defies the laws of physics and gravity and everything else. Um, that slowing down is going to happen. And slowing down raises political as well as economic challenges. But it's changed China. Uh, it hasn't changed the world very much. The global system, the international system, is pretty much the same as well. It hasn't changed the United States fundamentally, but it's changed China in, and it's still continuing to change China because this dynamic of modernization and the dynamic of modernization has been assisted by the United States. Where that, that got it, where that puts us today is China is a much more engaged, much more capable player and actor on the world stage. Indeed, I would argue that there is no significant international or transnational challenge. Climate change, proliferation, changing demographics around the globe, shifts in wealth, energy security, none that can be met successfully 
is the United States and China are not on basically the same page. In part because of the size, the two biggest economies, a whole lot of people when you put it together. But more to the point politically, that the rest of the world is not going to make the investments, not going to make the political decisions, not going to run the risks of going in a direction on any of these transnational challenges if they're concerned that either Washington or Beijing is going to oppose it, that they won't move on these until convinced that these two big players are on the same page. Let me close with a couple of numbers uh, that get to the, were we clever or were we stupid, uh, which way is, is China going in the world? A lot of people employ what I call a seesaw model of international politics. If country A is rising, country B must be going down. Um, it kind of defies actual study of history where you get more of the rising tide raises all boats phenomenon. But the relevance here is those who look at U.S.-China relations and see China's rise as linked to causing American decline. Uh, I believe that's wrong. And let me put a couple of numbers on it. 35 years ago, when China began its reform and opening program at a third plenum, I'll just uh, point out these are ones that set out guidelines. The third plenum had two interconnected decisions. One was launching reform and opening. The other was normalization of relations with the United States. It could not have launched reform and opening without the special relationship, the new relationship with the United States. And there would not have been, from the US perspective, a different relationship, political relationship, geopolitical relationship with China if it had not undertaken reform and opening. The two go together and they played out. At that time, the United States accounted for roughly 26% of the global economy. We've already heard about, we'll hear more about China's tremendous accomplishments. The figures that uh, Dan put up at the beginning here at the numbers are impressive. 35 years later, not just China's rise, but other things happened. Uh, the Cold War ended. The Central European countries that have been part of the war so joined the European Union. We now have dozens of countries growing at the rate that China grew in the 1980s. The world is rising as more prosperous than ever. Did the seesaw go down? The US share today of a much, much larger global economy has plunged all the way to 24.5%. A trivial change within the statistical era for these kinds of numbers. But we didn't get poorer, we didn't become less involved in this. China is much better off, we are much better off because of China's participation in the global economy. One more figure and then I will stop, but one more way to look at numbers. China is today the largest trading partner of all the countries in the region and many beyond that. This is a, the, the United States used to be the largest trading partner. Uh, uh, global shift in power, power transition in a way. If you look at it, what has happened is China's low cost, labor abundant economy has become the last stop in global or transnational production chains. So products that used to go to Malaysia or Indonesia or Taiwan or Korea at different times, 
for that last assembly to be put in a box to have the made-in sticker put on it and come to the United States, Japan, or Europe. Now stop in China and then go to those same big three markets. So it's an artifact of accounting rather than an indicator of shift in power. China is important in the global chain, but it's going to lose the advantages of low-cost labor because it's running out of low-cost labor. Labor costs are going up. You look at the demographics, yes, there's still an awful lot of young people. But within the next 12, 15 years, the over 65 population of China will exceed the total population of the United States. And unless one puts in place a social security network here, you've got one couple supporting four parents and eight grandparents. That's a pretty daunting proposition. My time is up. Let me close with just well, underscoring two points. One is China's rise is inextricably linked to its relationship with the United States and to U.S. support for assistance to China's rise. And we didn't do it because we were stupid. We did it because of enlightened self-interest. This has been win-win, overwhelmingly win-win. Are there problems in the relationship? Of course. Why are there problems? And is the number of problems growing? There are problems that are growing because we touch one another in more places from people to people to economic to operating around the globe. Uh, cooperation and competition in Libya to get our people out of the country. Uh, that this is normal in relationships. And for the most part, both sides are doing a pretty good job of managing it. Thank you.